You may be seated. Uh, folks, before I lead in the word of prayer, uh, we praise God for uh, Annie Harris's uh, daughter, Amy, uh, giving birth this past week. And uh, uh, some minor complications, but uh, child and mother are doing well at this point. And uh, also, we want to... Um, uh, Bob Ganway shared this with me before uh, church uh, about their friend, Bob... Bob Kossaboom. Uh He has a brain bleed. Uh, fell a couple times this past week, but uh, he has a brain bleed. Uh, brain, brain bleed, and uh, we want to lift him and his wife up in our thoughts and prayers this morning. Let's not forget Mike and Carol Shirtliff as well, and uh, the uh, number of others who struggle during this time. Um, anyway, God is great. God is good knows all about our needs and all about tomorrow, and he bids us to come. Uh, let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your eternal presence. And when I say gracious, Lord, I want to underscore that and uh, boldface that and italicize it. Uh, you're so, so gracious to each and every one of us and we bless you that we can gather here this morning and worship our great God and Savior the Lord Jesus Christ the one who has loved us all the way to the cross who has uh, bore our sins in his body that we might receive the gift of eternal life and father I think of what the Apostle John writes that we might know that we have eternal life and that we have it in his name. And we bless you this morning uh, for a great, great savior, as we just sang, who outshines all the angels in heaven, all the heavenly hosts, he outshines them all. And we thank you, Lord, this morning that we can call you our God, our savior, our brother, and our friend, uh, our strength, our hope, our joy, our peace, our rock, our fortress, uh, our salvation, uh, our stronghold, uh, everything, uh, you've given us everything in Christ, and we bless you for that. Uh, may that be uh, indelibly impressed upon our hearts and our minds this hour, this day. And so we, we bless you and we thank you uh, for your presence here today. Father, uh, we lift up the Kossabooms this morning and um, we pray that you would touch uh, Bob's body, uh, give the doctors wisdom. Uh, you know the situation completely and yet uh, we intercede for him and uh, for his wife this morning. Uh, may you give grace and peace and strength and hope and may you bring that to their hearts today. Um, we also pray, Father, too, that you would miraculously uh, and divinely touch that bleed, if it's your will. And we pray that uh, this would not physically or greatly affect him. Uh, we pray uh, that whatever is affected, Lord, um, if that's the case, that you would restore it uh, by your good grace and your good measure. Uh, also, Father, too, uh, we lift up uh, Mike Shirtliff this morning and Carol. Uh, bless their hearts, fill them with great joy and peace in the midst of this uh, trial that Mike is going through. Uh, and may you uh, bring great, great comfort to their hearts. Uh, thank you that uh, you're able to bring a peace that passes all understanding. And as they go through this trial, uh, may they sense your presence uh, in a, a very perfect way. Father, also we think of Sandy Sherman, lift her up. We lift up Fred Legler this morning. Uh, Want to um, bless uh, Edith Perfetti before your throne of grace as well, uh, that you would encourage all these uh, saints and these good people, uh, a people uh, that are your possession, 
uh, that you, where you've called them out of darkness into your marvelous light. And we pray uh, that you would lift their hearts and their eyes uh, heavenward um, as they uh, go through uh, struggles and trials. Also, Father, too, uh, want to uh, lift up Amy this morning and her child. And may uh, they both be a great blessing, uh, child to mother and mother to child. And we pray, Lord, that uh, the gospel would be passed off to the next uh, generation and the following generation and those generations after that. Uh, may great blessings come to their homes uh, as you go before them. Also, I uh, want to lift up uh, Lauren this morning as well as she recuperates, and we also want to lift up little Moses. And I pray that same prayer for the Moore family, uh, that the gospel would go in deep into the hearts of the children and their uh, children's children and any great-grandchildren, we pray, um, if that be your will. Uh, Father, lift up our country again afresh to you. Um, we... Uh, we need a great uh, turning, a great revival. Uh, we pray that it would start with each and every one of us, that it would start uh, here in this church or some other place uh, throughout the country, Father. Uh, may your Holy Spirit uh, set this country on fire uh, with people coming to you at unprecedented numbers. Uh, uh, we pray that you would be pleased to do that um, turn hearts to people, uh, to, uh, turn hearts of the people to yourself, um, that the church, uh, churches that preach your word would be on fire, and that there would be a great awakening and a great revival in this country in these last days. Uh, that's our prayer here, and that's our prayer for each and every one of us this morning. Uh, thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for hearing our prayers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture reading, Dave. This morning's first scripture reading from the New Testament, from the book of 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, the first five verses. And if you're using a Red Church Bible, it can be found on page 1152. Again, 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, the first five verses. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciousness have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our second reading this morning is from the first epistle of John. The second chapter, verses 18 to 29, and it's on page 1184 of the Red Church Bible. <coughs> Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. 
Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just, it has, just as it has taught you, remain in him. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. This is the word of our Lord. There's a lot in those verses of Scripture, folks. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, what you have laid upon my heart, I pray that you would give life uh, to your people this morning that uh, we might know that we've been with you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, folks, this morning I want to talk to you about fake news and fake views in our society. Uh, you know that the fake news phrase was coined by Donald Trump, and this phrase applies to the liberal media. And it's appropriate because uh, the liberal media uh, lies through its teeth. Ninety percent of the news outlets in America are liberal, and so you've got this constant bombardment of lies and untruth uh, pushing a, social, a socialistic agenda that's thoroughly anti-God, right? Constantly spinning a narrative, and it leads to fake news. Uh, Donald Trump was right. Fake views, this is an expression that I coined this morning for this message. It rhymes with fake news. Um, and um, it, it perfectly fits with what's happening in our society. Social upheaval is turning the normal social world that we're familiar with, the traditional world, inside out. I'll give you examples of fake views. Gay marriage. That's a fake view. Marriage is defined as between a man and a woman. You can't have gay marriage, but it's a fake view. Here you go. Gender identity. Uh, I got this from Google search. It's on Teen Talk. Teen Talk, right? Quote, there are many different gender identities today, including male, female, transgender, gender, neutral, non-binary, agender, pangender, queer gender, two-spirit, third gender, and all, none, or a combination of these things. Hello? Are you kidding me? There's only two. This is fake views, right? Fake news, fake views. When we think of fake news and fake views, what we typically do is we immediately go to the political and to the social wars that are being fought today and, you know, in, in America and around the world, right? I, I can only speak as to what is happening here based on what God gives me in terms of insight and understanding. Uh, I live in American culture. I don't live in Asian culture. I don't live in European culture. But folks, if it's happening here, it's probably happening there. And if not, it's just around the corner. Uh, you know, I, I used to say to people, I live in the twilight zone. Now I say to people, I live beyond the twilight zone. It's beyond it. You can't, you can't make this stuff up. Tell me, uh, tell me, where does this stuff come from? Who makes it up? 
And that's our focus this morning. It comes from the pit of hell. That's where it comes from. It comes from the demonic realm. It comes from fallen men and women. It can come from within the institutional church. And it can come from without the institutionalized church. And today, it's largely being pushed by our government. Go figure. In John's epistle, he brings up spiritual deception. Now, John is the only writer in all of Scripture who uses the term antichrist. Others, other portions of Scripture speak of the person, the lawless one, the king in, 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 that's referred to in Daniel. But John is the only one that uses the term antichrist. And so he's not speaking of a particular person here, but he's speaking in general of the spirit, antichrist spirit. And that was prevalent back in John's day, and it's very, very prevalent today. So let's, let's define this concept here. It is a spirit that essentially opposes everything that God stands for. Traditional marriage, male, female, <laughs> you can see it, right? It's a spirit that is totally ingrained in our culture, every part of it. And John warns in the scriptures here about being led astray, being seduced by this antichrist spirit. And many are being seduced by it. And many churches are being seduced by it. And many believers are being seduced by it. And it's like a spiritual riptide. You ever see what, you know what a riptide is, right? The water just converges it and just goes straight out. And you get sucked away. You get swept away. To the, most of the time when people get caught up in a riptide, a rip current, they drown. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, the same as seducing spirits, and things taught by demons. Uh, we're seeing it. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Fake views, fake news. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Ephesians 6, Paul reminded us that we do not war against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers and against the forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, and those that exist in the world. You know, the other week I gave you a bulletin insert about the bill, H.R. 1. It's called the uh, Equality Act. Uh, I encouraged you to call your senators. I've already done that. I encourage you to call your senators, even though they're liberal. They, God may give them ears to hear. What I did was this. I didn't call up and make it a, a, a big Christian thing. I called up and I made it about women. Because maybe perhaps they'll listen when you talk about how it's going to hurt women as opposed to how it's going to hurt the church. Or if you talk about a moral issue, they'll just fluff you right off. Talk, make it about women. The Equality Act, it's fake news and fake views. There's nothing equality about it. I will read again, because maybe you didn't get a copy, but um, I will read this. I will read two excerpts that uh, were written, I believe, by Franklin Graham. Uh, quote, the Equality Act designates, and this is important, schools, churches, and healthcare organizations as public accommodations. With this, schools, churches, and hospitals could be forced to accept the government's beliefs and mandates about sexual orientation and gender identity. That would be highly intrusive and incredibly far-reaching 
It will threaten everyday speech where people can be fined or lose their jobs for using the wrong names or pronouns. Here's, here's the, another one, another section that Franklin Graham wrote. The Equality Act will legislate that we allow boys and girls, allow boys and girls sports, boys and girls sports, boys and girls, uh, boys and girls locker rooms, and men and women's shelters. Let me read this again. The Equality Act will allow boys into girls' sports, boys into girls' locker rooms, and men and, and men and women's shelters combined, and men and women's. Uh, uh, I think I got this wrong here. And it, it will force teachers and students to publicly pretend that a biological male is female. Schools will be encouraged or mandate to instruct first, second, and third graders that they can choose to be a boy or a girl or neither or both, making biological sex science, biological sex and science a relic of the past. Do you want your kids going to churches or schools like that? Do you want your grandkids? Sexual orientation and gender identity, fake news, fake views. Franklin Graham referred to this as a dangerous threat to our nation. Uh, he's right about that, but it's more than this. This is demonic. This is thoroughly demonic, and it's devoid of biblical truth. Uh, Warren Wearsby, Christian author, many of you are familiar with the name, 25 years ago he wrote, quote, as never before, Christians today need ability to distinguish between right and wrong, between truth and error. The notion is widespread in our generation that there are no absolutes, that nothing is always wrong, and that nothing is always right. False doctrines, therefore, are more prevalent than any time in history, and most men and women seem to be willing to accept almost any teaching except the truths of the Bible. This, this was 25 years ago. Fast forward 25 years later, it's worse. The other night, I watched our president speak for, I could only do it for 10 minutes because my head was ready to explode. I, I tried to stay with, with it, but I just couldn't. And what I'm going to say is not popular, but it's true. President Biden spoke about, quote, finding light in the darkness. He says, it's what Americans are good at. Let's hope so. But beware of politicians when they use or quote a reference from Scripture. This is like, you know, Star Wars. You ever see Star Wars? It's like the Sith Lord walking, uh, talking about finding light on the dark side. Come join me and find light. Are you kidding me? This is the guy that's promoting chaos. He's promoting doctrines of demons. And, and I'm sorry, maybe perhaps you voted for him, I'm sorry. But you probably voted wrong. No, you did vote wrong. Doctrines of demons, you can't make this stuff up. The Equality Act is darkness, it's chaos, it's not light, it's evil. It's from the pit of hell. Joe Biden and the Democratic Party are pushing it. I've said this before. This is not the party of your mother and father. This is the party of Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and Khrushchev. And they'll take no prisoners. The Republican Party, not a city on a shining hill, I got that. But at least they're trying to stop it. They're not promoting it. It's madness. Total madness. I ask you this morning, you, you tell me what would our Lord Jesus Christ say about this? Anybody? Tell me. What would, what would the Apostle Paul say? What would the Apostle Peter say? What would the Apostle John say? Talk about the spirit of Antichrist. They'd all say it was demonic and evil. And what John wrote about 2,000 years ago is in full bloom today. 
Harold referred to your insert earlier in the service. Read it. Paul Harvey, 1965, he wrote that. You talk about prophetic. Everything he wrote's come true, sadly. I ask you, what makes someone promote this stuff except the demonic? People that are unsaved and devoid of the Spirit of God. That's what it is. In 1 Timothy 4, Paul speaks about deceitful or seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. How, how are we to understand this, this phrase? Well, if you take a look at the context, it's, it's at the heart of obscuring gospel truth. Basically, it comes down to man-made rules and regulations that blind people into seeing the glory of Christ that salvation, that salvation is by God's grace through faith. But no, you start layering it with all man-made rules and regulations. And then, of course, if you want to go deeper into the you know, seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, they'll corrupt the person of Christ. Oh, he's not God. Uh, they'll corrupt the work of Christ. Well, he didn't really resurrect from the dead. Um, the nature of God, that's, what, that's, what, that's, that's all the demonic. Demons use unsaved people, their vessels, in a spirit of hypocrisy and lying. That's what Paul taught in 1 Timothy 4. It, it amounts to fake news and fake views. That's what it is. They add to the gospel, they take away from the freedom in Christ. From legalism to licentiousness, it's one extreme or the other. And you know, it's funny, as I, as I read the Word of God, God condemns both. Anything goes, He condemns. And legalism that takes away your freedom in Christ, he condemns that too. You know, we typically think of this stuff as coming up from within the church, right? And it has. But these days, it's coming more so from outside the church. It's no longer disguised with some sort of religious veneer. It's an actual full-blown outward assault on the fabric and foundation of our society and the Word of God and the government, your government, these United States of America is pushing it. Folks, somebody has hijacked this nation. And organizations, corporate and religious, are buying into it because they don't want to be censored. We talked about that last month, right? Or because they're drinking the Kool-Aid. They believe in this stuff. Here's, here's one for you. Grace Church School, Manhattan, New York, affiliated with the National Association of Episcopalian Schools. A close affiliation with Grace Episcopal Church in Manhattan. I have a basic sense of probably what they believe, but let me tell you. Now they're teach, going to teach the kids. You can no longer say mom or dad. Can't call your mom, mom. Can't call your dad, dad. You have to use the term guardian. Next, it'll probably be like Guardian of the Galaxy or something, right? Uh, what kind of society tells you you can't use terms like mom and dad? A demonic society. And, and think about it. If you can't use terms like mom and dad, then you're not going to be able to use terms like grandma and grandpa. That's coming next. They're going to take that. And what about aunt and uncle? Stay tuned. I got it. Why don't we just do this? Why don't we call everyone and everything Cousin It? Remember Cousin It from the Adams family? You know, Cousin It, you know, the long shaggy thing. Uh, by the way, uh, the Department of Health Services uh, guy, girl, It, whatever, that Biden picked, to be heading up that department. It looks like Cousin Ed. What a freak show. It's a freak show. You can't say he or she anymore because somebody might be offended. So I'll Cousin Ed. 
Or how about the thing? We'll just call people the thing. Remember the thing? It was the Adams family. The hand would come up out of the box. Right? The thing. Sounds about right. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, this, this is insane. This is demonic to the core. Doctrines of demons full, on full display for the world to see. If they have ears to hear and eyes to see. Uh, we just finished looking at Genesis chapter 6 in Wednesday night um, Bible study. And we looked at the passage, the phrase, the sons of God taking the daughters of men. And it's a, it's a very, very controversial passage. Uh, and I'm not going to get into... The, there's three interpretations. It's, you know, uh, tyrannical despot kings that, you know, kind of took uh, the daughters of women. Uh, it's the um, Sethites as sons of God taking Canaanites, uh, the, uh, somebody from the ungodly line, or the interpretation is angels, uh, that the sons of God are angels, and they uh, cohabited and sought to cro procreate with um, human beings. Uh, I take that latter version. But it, it matters not what, at this particular point, because for my point this morning is this. This is the principle that comes out of that. An ungodly and unholy union. That's what comes out of Genesis chapter 6. And there are other passages that speak to those ungodly uh, unions as well, physically and spiritually. For example, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, uh, Paul speaks of believers not being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh, here's a series of questions. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? And they're all rhetorical questions, nothing. What fellowship has Christ with, uh, what fellowship has light with darkness? Nothing. What harmony does Christ have with the devil? Nothing. What has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Nothing. So, that goes after the physical, ungodly unions, and it goes after the spiritual as well. Here's one, Revelation chapter 2. The message to the church in Pergamum, the imagery here is that Pergamum is a very unhealthy church. It entered into an unholy and godless spiritual union. Uh, the, 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 if you break down the word, it leads to an elevation of some sort of marriage or union. That's what Pergamos means, or Pergamum. And, and the church of Pergamum was about compromise. Some believe that it was actually the union of church and state as the spiritual compromise. In other words, the church was complicit in embracing a spiritual union of ideas with what was being promoted. Uh, we, always, we always hear the expression, uh, separation of church and state, right? It's important for you to know this. That phrase never occurs in the Constitution. It, one of the founding fathers used it in a letter, and the Supreme Court used it in their ruling uh, regarding... First Amendment. But it was, never, it was never ever intended to mean that Christians do not serve in government. What it was intended to mean was that the government does not encroach on the church. It was intended to keep the temporal realm of government, the physical realm, separate from the spiritual realm, which is God-ordained, the church. Because both governments are ordained of God. And so it was given, or was used to make, make sure that they're separate. Why? Because the church is always decimated when it unites with the church. Always. Church always fares worse. And here's the other thing I want to say. The state should never ever be dictating to the church. Because the church is the foundation and the pillar of the truth in society. It's the Jiminy Cricket. It's the moral conscience. But that's what we have in America today. And we're going to have more of it if this Equality Act passes. Stay tuned for that, too.
Here's another example of deceitful spirits, seducing spirits working through people. China. Have you heard? Let's go overseas for a minute. China uh, is now changing the Word of God. Uh, this was in the Federalist, uh, news, uh, Federalist uh, newspaper or reporting and then also Family Research Council. Uh, quote, one way China seeks to sign, uh, sinicize, that is, you know, make more Chinese, one, one, one way China seeks to sinicize Christianity is by rewriting the Bible. A complete communist translation has yet to be revealed. The news of one chapter's government-approved revision left Christians in China outraged last month. A textbook for a class on professional ethics and law at the government-run University of Electronic Science and Technology Press quotes the Bible's book of John, chapter 8. Listen to this. Quote, in the passage, an adulterous woman is brought to Jesus and her accusers ask if she should be killed by, sto be, if she should be killed by stoning for her sins. In every authentically translated version of Scripture, Jesus responds, quote, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. These words disperse the angry crowd. And Jesus tells the woman, Go, and from now on, sin no more. Well, the Chinese Communist Party's version takes a different turn. In, telling, in this telling, the crowd leaves. But Jesus tells the woman, I too am a sinner, but if the law could only be executed by men without blemish, the law would be dead. Then Jesus proceeds to stone the woman. That's your Communist Party version. Do you think that will ever happen here? You get a socialistic government, party of Mao, Lenin, Khrushchev, Val Putin, you get, a, you get a communist party, you get a, a socialist government here, that'll happen here. Hands down, guaranteed. This is why I'm talking about it. Anything that is a departure from Holy Scripture is a departure from Christ, and it's a union with the demonic, and it's a union with doctrines of demons. That's what it is. And John reminds us here in 1 John chapter 2 that we have an anointing from the Holy One. And it, the Scripture says His anointing teaches us all things. Now, what that doesn't mean is this, is that when we come to this good book, you and I know everything. It doesn't mean we know everything under the sun. And it doesn't mean that we don't need pastors and teachers in the church, because that would be in direct opposition to John writing his epistle to the church. See, John was a teacher, right? And it would also conflict with Ephesians 4, where God gives gifted teachers to the church. Verse 27 is often taken to dismiss human teachers, and that's not the intent here. No one can say we don't need to be taught. The way you want to understand this is this. John is implying that we're not wholly dependent upon human teachers, but we're ultimately dependent upon the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. And so when we're dependent upon Christ, as I preach or anybody else preaches, you filter and you hear and you listen, and then you affirm whether that what came, came from that minister or that teacher is from God in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit teaches you ultimately. That's John's point. And so I, so I ask you, uh, what does the Spirit of God say to your heart in all these matters this morning? What does the Spirit of God say? Are you, are you able to identify fake news and fake views? Are you able to discern doctrines of demons, seducing spirits? Are you willing to engage on a level where you speak up?
Our society today is the way it is because people are not, good people are not speaking up. Churches aren't speaking up. Pastors aren't speaking up. God's people are not speaking up. They just like as if I sweep the dirt underneath the rug, everything will go away. What happens when the rug is removed? Dirt's still there, right? Uh, we, we have been complicit. We have been compromised. We, we, we can't sit back and not say anything anymore. Amen? You've got to speak to people. You know, I think we don't do it because we're afraid of the consequences. We don't want people beating down our door at night, kind of like what they did to righteous Lot. We don't want the trouble. We don't want to become martyred for our faith now, do we? We want everything that God gives us and it's all good, but we don't, we don't want the trouble. You know, it was brought to my, brought to my attention in uh, 2019, there was a Barna research article about faith trends in the country. And it was about the most post-Christian cities in America. Do you know that living in New England, it's right in the wheelhouse? This is ground zero. Did you know that? For a post-Christian culture? Uh, listen to this. According to Barna's most recent data, which includes the addition of a number of new cities since 2017, the most post-Christian city in America, Springfield, and then what they do is they, they link cities and areas Springfield and Holyoke, number one most godless post-Christian cities in America, right here in Massachusetts. Probably has something to do with the uh, University of Massachusetts, Amherst, I think. Uh, that's, that's the first in, in, in a row of eight. Listen to this. Um, Portland and Auburn, Maine. It's new, new, Northeastern Carter here now. Um, second, Providence to New Bedford, number three on the list. Um, four, Burlington, Vermont. Five, Boston makes, Boston makes five. From Boston, Massachusetts to New, Manchester, New Hampshire, that's their five position. Albany and Schenectady and Troy, New York is sixth position. Hartford and New Haven, Connecticut, the seventh, and Rochester, New York, eight. The other two, one's in California and one's in Seattle, a Seattle, uh, Tacoma area. Now, if I had asked you of the worst cities spiritually in the country, you would have probably started with what? L.A. L.A. California, Seattle, Washington. No, it's right here, folks. Right here. I'm telling you, you and I are the frog in the kettle. We're getting boiled slowly and we don't even realize it. And it's time to jump out and it's time to croak. It's time to speak up. You know, I, I've said this before through the years. It's worth repeating. And you know this. I think many of you know this. Martin Niemöller, German theologian, Lutheran pastor. You know where I'm going, right? He spent years in a Nazi concentration camp because he opposed them. And he said, and you know this quote, first they came for the socialists and I didn't speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. I tell you, that's going to be you and me. And other people, if you don't speak up. When we keep silent, we essentially isolate I think we know what isolation is about through this past year, right? And in effect, what happens, it begets a death sentence. Uh, this is amazing how God brings everything together. This past week, somebody shared with me a section 
from C.S. Lewis's words of wisdom in 1942 from the Screw Tape Letters. Now, the Screw Tape Letters is a book about a demon, Uncle Screw Tape, teaching another demon, nephew Wormwood, how to secure the damnation of this British man. And they and, and so it's kind of like the senior elder demon giving counsel and wisdom to the younger demon on how he could do his job better. And it, it's applicable today. Let me read this. The young demon asked the old demon, so how did you manage to bring many souls to hell? The old demon answered, I just instilled fear in them. The younger said, great job. And what were they afraid of? Wars? Hunger? The older demon answered, no, they were afraid of the disease. The younger demon replies, what does this mean? They didn't get sick? Are, are they not dead? There was no rescue for them? The old demon answered, but no, they got sick, died, and the rescue was there. The young devil surprised and answered, uh, I don't understand. The old demon answered, well, you know, they believed the only thing they have to keep at any cost is their lives. They stopped hugging and greeting each other. They moved away from each other. They gave up all social contacts and everything that was human. Later, they ran out of money, lost their jobs, and that was their choice because they were afraid for their lives. But that's why they quit their jobs. That, uh, that's why they quit their jobs, even without having bread. They belie believed blindly everything they heard and read in the papers. They gave up their freedoms. They didn't leave their own homes literally anywhere. They stopped visiting family and friends. The world turned into such a concentration camp without forcing them into captivity. They accepted everything just to live at least one more miserable day. And so the old demon says, and so, and so living, they died every day. And that's how it was easy for me to take their miserable souls to hell. From C.S. Lewis, 1942. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, isolation is killing our society. Physically, people have embraced lying spirits and doctrines of demons. From this COVID thing, which is the biggest joke, to all the other stuff they're just ramming down your throat. It's the biggest joke. It's fake news, fake views. Do your research. And you know something? the church has spiritually bought into it as well. We're not supposed to say or do anything. Like the good, silent, complacent Christian, we're just supposed to go along just so we get along. Uh-uh, that's not me. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing it. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, did not righteous Lot try that? How did that work out for him? It kind of reminds me of 1 Kings 22. I don't know if you're familiar with it. A kind of obscure chapter. Most of the time we don't go into 1 Kings for devotions, do we? A lying spirit was sent out to deceive King Ahab. And that lying spirit put a lying word in all the mouths of the false prophets that Ahab was listening to. And ultimately it led to his death. And by... So, and so by embracing fake news and fake views, embracing lying and deceiving doctrines of demons, hypocrisy and all that, it leads to death, spiritually and physically. It's a death sentence. C.S. Lewis had it right. In closing... Somebody beautifully wrote, and I echo these words, somebody beautifully wrote, quote, It is my hope that you will join with me praying daily for a revival in our lives, our churches, our communities, and our nations. We must decide to be different, Christ-focused. 
What offends him should offend us. What breaks his heart should break ours. What he loves, we should love. The world desperately needs Jesus, and we know he is the answer to the challenges in our families, our nation, and our world. May God send his Holy Spirit to revive each of us first so that we will be effective instruments for him in this world, our temporary home. Jesus commands each of us to go. Go in his name and the power of the Holy Spirit and change our world. We must go and go quickly. The clock of eternity is ticking and the midnight hour is rapidly approaching. Jesus, our King, our Lord, is preparing to return and we must take our, make ourselves ready and go make disciples in this world where we are living. Unquote. Amen. I say amen to all that. I encourage you to confront the fake news and the fake views. Croak. Don't get boiled. Croak. Speak out. And give them the Lord Jesus Christ. Give them Christ. Um, what else is there to give them? This? It's no prize, folks, is it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give each and every one of us a righteousness and a boldness as a lion, and that we would not fear uh, the hordes of godless people that uh, promote uh, doctrines of demons and ungodliness in this world. Uh, may we take a stand politically and socially and spiritually. And may you give us the grace, Lord, uh, with uh, the grace of a megaphone to speak out, to stand up and to be counted. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that when we speak, uh, that true to Scripture, that we would speak uh, the words that the Holy Spirit would lead us to speak to the glory of Christ. That's my prayer. Uh, that's my prayer for myself and for your people here. Uh, we thank you for the scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation, for the scriptures that we looked at this morning. Uh, give us spiritual discernment and understanding. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.